he wasn't able to make it, so I'm standing in as the um, moderator. And I'm Melissa Lochnan. I'm a curator and uh, art consultant. And um, together we have uh, Shannon Goodwin, who's the director of Bus Projects. Um, Clinton Ng, who's a collector and philanthropist, and Tom Hugo, who's Google Labs creative director. Um, I have some brief bios for everyone, just so that you've got a little bit of a background as well. So Shannon's the director of Bus Projects, an independent arts organisation based in Melbourne. Prior to this position, he worked as program coordinator of visual arts at Metro Arts Brisbane and project assistant exhibition management at Queensland Art Gallery Goma. Shannon was founding co-director and chair of the board of Box Copy, an artist-run space in Brisbane, and is also an artist working predominantly in the medium of digital video. Clinton um, is a Sydney-based collector and philanthropist who has built a substantial collection of leading contemporary art in just over, over, just, just over 10 years. His collection includes works by over 150 artists, including Oliver Elison, Simon Denny, William Kentridge, Sean Gladwell, Thomas Hirshhorn, and Patricia Piccinini. With the same diligence and passion that enabled him to amass his collection within a short period, Ing is now sharing his love for art by adopting a generous lending policy to public institutions and supporting local emerging artists and art institutions. Uh, and now we have Tom as well, who's the creative director of Google's Creative Lab in Sydney. He works with cultural and creative organisations around the world, exploring the space between technology and the arts and what can happen when they intersect. He has a history of, in the arts, a love of literature, and a problem with staying focused. <laughs> he speaks graphics geek, a bit of web dev, some Python, a touch of digital strategy, and remedial project management. He's also just recently joined the board of Sydney Biennale. So, I also have a little introduction here and was also going to note that this is being filmed, so you can watch this on the uh, live on the, on the Sydney Contemporary website, and also later it will be recorded and you can watch it on the site. <laughs> uh, so we're here to discuss the develop, developing movement of post-internet art, which will be the most significant of its kind to emerge in a while. The key to understanding what post-internet means is that it doesn't suggest that the huge technological developments associated with the internet are finished and behind us. Instead, in the same way that postmodern artists absorbed and adapted the strategies of modernism for a new aesthetic era, post-internet artists have moved beyond making work de dependent on the novelty of the web to using, it to using its tools to tackle other subjects. And while earlier internet artists often made works with, that existed exclusively online, the post-internet generation, many who have been using the internet since they could walk, frequently uses digital strategies to create objects that exist in the real world. So now in taking this to the panel, what is post-internet art? Who wants to start? <laughs> Tanny, you go first. All right. Well, I guess as the junior member of the panel here, um, I, guess I, I guess for me when thinking about the subject uh, and thinking about speaking here today, I guess I, I looked back at, at um, uh, work, especially work that, had come, that I had worked um, with artists on, um, that it evidenced this symptom, I guess this symptom identified as, as post-internet art. Um, and generally that was emerging at the, the kind of crossing of a number of, uh, of disciplines, design, fashion, people who were, do, who were working in design both in print and online, um, people who were engaging in very avant-garde fashion practices, um, and this seemed to foster uh, perhaps um, uh, this kind of ripe zone where the the online space was for them a, uh, a tool, but also something that they had used to inform their, their practices as they existed in, in many uh, spaces. So for me it was an observable uh, symptom and, that, and it was a useful term perhaps to start conversations around why this work had certain characteristics, why it was a little um, different, and also how to relate it internationally as well. So I'm talking in a very local context about work that seemed to observe these or evidence these symptoms. Uh, but it also was a useful way for me to kind of internationalize kind of what, what people were doing in Melbourne, where I come from, uh, where I'm coming here from today. Um, so, so those are the kind of things for me that um, uh, characterized this kind of post-internet art, the kind of 
um, uh, often uh, chaotic, often interdisciplinary, multimedia, um, sometimes self-obsessed, sometimes self-aggrandized, a kind of mesh of, of outcomes. Um, so uh, maybe I'll say that and pass it over. Hmm. Yes, I, uh, my take of it is that uh, post-internet art, uh, uh, to borrow a term that has been uh, coined by the people at Allen Center who put on a, a show of post-internet art uh, in the last few years is art that's made with a consciousness of the internet. Um, and um, I guess it's interesting to me because um, in our lives from day to day we engage uh, with the internet and so it's only natural that as young artists that uh, they're using the internet in various ways to either to um, be the conception of the work, the production of the work, um, this dispersion and distribution and then the viewing of the work itself um, all involving the internet. So, you know, I think it's art that's very of the now and I think that's why it's interesting to me because as a collector, I want to collect works that are of now that speaks about uh, life today in the world that I live in. And post-internet art is very much that. It's what we experience from day to day. Um, and um, therefore, you know, interesting in that, that, that sense. Um, um, <clears throat> Well, I might say that I struggle slightly with the term um, because it, it, it strikes me that it's very difficult for an artist to make work without awareness of the internet or, or, or it, would be, it would be easier to define work that was made sort of consciously without, without reference to the internet. And so, and, it, and it's been born out of this strangely sort of social sort of set in that it is very much m more like a, like a group, like the London School. Um, or, or a sort of, or, although whilst geographic, less ideological um, in, its, in its birthing, but has reaching, or is reaching a point where that definition, or, or the, 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 you know, as you describe it, is becoming kind of really very strong and prevalent in an awful lot of work. So um, whilst it defines one thing, it, it seems more applicable to, to, to a, um, a broader sense of where the art world is at the moment. So, so it's kind of um, nuggety. There's, there's, there's a lot of things that one needs to pull out, um, both about the, the, the semantics of the phrase and, and sort of the ontology of the whole, the whole idea. Um, so, it is, um, so what it is is incredibly difficult. Um, and that's, that's, sort of, that's sort of how I, I, I sort of perceive it at the moment. But it's also a fascinating, fascinating space. Me to my next question, which is, why do you think the movement is termed post-internet art? You know, and, and isn't all art that's been made after the internet was invented post-internet art in a way? Well, it's not really, but but why does some art get this label and some not? Yeah, I think uh, it's always been quite controversial. People have been arguing, you know, we're not post-internet. Um, we're still very much in the age of the internet, so why is it called post-internet art? So I think there have been lots and lots of people who have criticized the term, and I would agree with them. But uh, uh, for lack of a better term, I suppose it's, it's something that's being used right now. From my reading, I think um, the first few people that coined the term, there was this, um, um, this artist called Marisa Olsen, who um, um, she was on the internet, she was surfing things on the internet, and then she made art after she was on the net. And, coined the term post-internet art, as in literally she you know, made art after she'd been on the internet. Uh, but I think it probably is a lot wider than that. But uh, from my understanding, it was one of the first instances where the term was used. I think, um, I mean, also for me, in terms of some of my reading, it, uh, I mean, it's a useful term in terms of criticism. It's often good to put forward a more dramatic term to, to force an argument, the end of art. These kind of um, things become quite useful touchstones for criticism and discussion, but it also mean, it also puts the internet as a moment, the moment of the internet, and then the, the now, um, from the generation that has grown up kind of meshed within it. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that 
that term sort of signals a, um, a post-moment uh, generation of people who are, who are dealing with it, um, and not as a novelty, but as, as people kind of said, um, but as something that is simply a, a kind of a, a I guess a tool. I, I think it, it's it's a hard term in terms of um, applying it to a, a kind of a body of, of practice. I think that's still a, an interesting thing to discuss. But. It's it's really tricky mm. because, like, if you want to take a kind of dialectic point of view, you have to, you can't ignore postmodernism, but but which was a, a response to modernist practice, and, and you sort of see this pulling apart of, of the structures and and how those how um, a modernist work sort of was created and, and, and it in, in sort of, though that work invokes this kind of playfulness and this pulling apart of, of what was, what, what had been so dominant for so long. Um, and so it evokes that, but then immediately rejects it because that's not what it is. Um, and at the same time, it also rejects this notion that there is no longer an internet because we can all see there is still a very well-functioning internet. Um, and, and does, as you say, Clinton, kind of look, point, sort of, Wants to wants to wants to use that phrase "post" as a way of saying um, now that we have now that now that this is every day now that this is very mundane, you you it's not a novelty it's not a new thing. Um, so the, the post bit has all these kind of very strong kind of art historical kind of sort of feelings, um, which we are expected to n not pay attention to, um, and then internet is actually, so there is internet art, there's net art, and that was an incredibly powerful, I think, movement and collection of artists um, and groups, people like Fat Lab or Jody, who were doing, um, people, groups like um, Fat Lab or Jody, who were doing um, really kind of transgressive um, art sort of experiences, because, that, that existed in an online capacity, that were not commodifiable, did not work well within the art world system. Um, so in the, in the neatest way, post-internet would be that this is a, is a move on from that work. And, and in that sense, it works terribly well because it's actually also a huge reappropriation of that kind of work into the gallery system, which did not really feel like engaging with internet art and working out how to sell it and how to show it and the institutions. And it, it was unownable and highly distributed and extraordinarily hard to sell. So um, it has all these sort of um, beginnings of meaning. Um, and that's why it's a fascinating phrase, because all of those are very troubling. But frankly, that's fine. Yeah. Um, it's fine to have those umbrella terms that, that, are, that, that cause us to stop and think about that work. Um, the only thing that I find troubling is that at the moment it sits very much on a relatively small group of artists where I feel it's, it, the ideas that are being um, explored are, are applicable to a much broader kind of group um, around the world. So, so um, why it's called post-internet art, Clinton kind of neatly grabbed, which is that Maria basically called it post-internet art and then spent yeah. quite a lot of time making sure that everyone else called it post-internet art as well. And also I think because it's a process and we're right in the middle of the the beginning of the process. I think it's been present maybe um, six, seven years. So, so we're still right at the beginning of that phase where, you know, it, it's considered a movement. It's it's coined post-internet art, and maybe you know, 20, 30 years down the track, we might look back and say, yeah, I guess there was a, a quite a well-defined movement called the post-internet um, art and artists and artisans. I think it's too. Yeah, and I think it's. I mean, that that small. Um, it's often uh, the fact that one can identify movements through a very intense small group uh, in dialogue with each other. And I, although the internet is, is, is a large place, it seems to me as I um, am fascinated by artists who perhaps are could put in within this bracket, it is in fact that coded, um, that really heady coded language that comes out of the, the internet, this kind of deep um, uh, sort of you know, almost deep tumbler, perhaps I could, I could call it, uh, that becomes, once you kind of start down this exploration of how this, um, uh, whether it's small or, or large, it seems very small when you're there. It's like going into someone's very messy uh, or very um, a cluttered kind of bedroom almost, and, and you kind of navigate through these many, many cluttered bedrooms and the way they communicate with each other or shout through this window that they have. Um, it seems to me that it, it always seems small to me, this conversation, although 
it's being had by many people, um, and it drips into into more kind of um, uh, larger kind of pop culture realms um, in often very dis, um, uh, very very kind of diluted ways. Um, but it seems like that close conversation is what's yielding this kind of um, quite fierce um, uh, thing that people are paying attention to. Um, so we're, if we were to really discuss the parameters of post-internet art and come to a definition, or if we were to go into a museum and label something as post-internet art, what would be our descriptors? That's a good question. Mm. Clinton, you, you own post-internet, um, the best person to. <laughs> yeah, I guess, um, again, there's some quality about the work that has been uh, made or created or conceived related to the internet. So it may be, you know, I think the internet for us is an archive. It's a, a modern library of resources that we go to to um, mine information, to gather information. It's a storage facility for us that we can, you know, go to and gather information. But also I think for us, uh, many of us, it's a, a means of communication. So, you know, if we were to look at both internet art then it has to be uh, um, something about the way that uh, the art was made or is, is speaking about which has something to do with the way the internet functions in our life. Um, so, you know, I think um, um, it may be the fact that the artists used uh, stock images from uh, the bank of imagery that we find on the internet. It may be a commentary about how we communicate these days on Facebook or you know, um, Instagram, it may be um, projection about what our future looks like, data mining, surveillance. So, you know, I think there are lots of different aspects and which, which makes it uh, quite broad and quite uh, um, all encompassing. But it's very much of the things that we deal with day to day, day in, day out, um, you know, be it shopping or whatever else that we do on the net these days. I, I, I completely agree, actually. I think it is very much about um, the sort of the language of internet that, that has, has, because it has moved, if we want to talk post-internet, has become banal, has become completely invisible to us. And if you really stopped and thought about the, the amount of um, signifiers, the amount of symbols and, and um, images and types of images and types of communication and everything from... The, the quality that you expect on a YouTube video to um, the, the, the glyphs and icons and um, sort of lag, things like buffering symbols. These things that now have, over the last 10 years, acquired significance to us, both through the process of, of using these things. And then you take these, so, so it, it's perfectly understandable, I think, if, to, to argue that you, that any artists that are um, recontextualizing that language, this, this, this invisible, a sort of unconscious automatic that we have, that we understand if you stopped and thought about it, is very internet-y and, and didn't even exist beforehand, then when you, when you recontextualize that into artwork, then you are bringing, bringing a kind of knowledge and awareness without it actually having to be rooted in uh, code. Um, and, and having to be an online experience, which is much more the, the, the former sort of movement. Um, that's, that's sort of what I look for in, in if you want, sort of signifiers. It, it does seem to be a very, um, uh, what would I say, front-end kind of experience as well. Like, uh, it, is, it seems like a, a, a movement that is very much built on pieces of technology that are already in existence. It doesn't seem one that is, is sort of okay. overly involved in coding, building back-end systems. It seems like there's a lot of um, uh, exploiting of, I mean, that's why there's, this, um, in, especially in the artists that exist in this strange crossover design, uh, crossover fashion world, there seems to be a very much this kind of stock cut and paste, mm -hmm. very clunky text kind sure. of generators. And, it is and somewhat behind where the actual extraordinary creativity of the internet is, and that's a slightly different discussion. But where, where you are using the, the technology, which is actually a lot of the work that I do, and we try and work with traditional art forms, um, or, or con more conventional artists, to allow them to understand the tools that are available. And that's, that's definitely not really where this is. This is more a reflection on where the everyday is, where the now is. Um, it's, a, it's a really you know, valid point, actually. Um, 
Yeah, in some ways, in, uh, some of the post-internet art that I'm familiar with is actually quite lo-fi in a way and yeah. kind of uh, embracing pixelation and uh, really old school 90s graphics and... Uh, Photoshop films. Yeah, and really Photoshop and like typical that. fonts, really, really kind of um, atypical now, yeah. um, but typical of the 90s. Um, which is also really interesting as well that it's almost kind of, in a way, it's kind of a, a nostalgia yeah. for the internet. But I guess like even if you're looking at art which is not post internet, say like Ricky Swallow used to make sculptures of turntables and all transistor radios, you know, things that were of the, the past and like you say, it's nostalgic and mm. so I guess I uh, found it and, and an enormous amount of video art, I mean, especially the beginnings of video art, where artists finally, and it's actually about tools of distribution, tools of, of production. So when artists are able to get their hands on tools, they are not normally when they are at their most expensive. So, so the video cameras be became available in the 70s and 80s to artists, and, and for, but, but they did not bring with them the production skills or the lighting knowledge or anything that was going to lead to... Um, sort of highly produced objects. Mm -hmm. And so, so what actually is quite interesting, I think more recently, is that you are beginning to see, as, as the artists catch up, you are beginning to see a, a, a much greater degree of polish on works and a much sort of, because those means of production are coming along as well. Pe people are able, we are able to make, um, because the computers allow us to, more beautiful images. And it's mm -hmm. very, it's a, it's a strange, aspect to the works. I think in mm. terms of that increased um, production as well, there's an interesting, um, uh, I, think, I think maybe it's even the, like I was going to say, the thing that's con constantly in my mind is, is that I can, um, if, if I could work out a way to do it, I could upload 4K, you know, videos to YouTube mm. and these kind of things, or um, I watch sort of um, uh, a lot of uh, YouTubers who kind of produce this very intense, but they tend, <laughs> some of the most famous ones are, are still on very, very ordinary subject matters. One of the artists who um, I sort of mentioned in my notes, um, Emil Zeal, who did a talk the other day as well, particularly plays in this kind of interesting space where he does have the ability to do high production work. You know, there's very high, you know, 4K uses of equipment and he has the knowledge to do it, but he still kind of channels that through very low-fi ideas or, but I think people are kind of yeah. It's actually, and it, it will be very interesting, just like with video art, they actually held on to that aesthetic for a very long time. So we were watching kind of this sort of, not Pixar, but you know, the, that sort of 16 millimeter films and which didn't really go anywhere and lasted for two hours. And, um, and actually, it, even though it was perfectly reasonable to get hold of a proper um, video equipment, and, and, and I, the Apple have just released their new iPhone, which shoots in 4K, 4K basically being um, super high spec video. Um, and so, so you will have your little thing in your pocket which enables you to make these things, but that would defeat the aesthetic of the movement. So, so there's this interesting, uh, the interesting problem of whether it stays rooted in a time as a reflection of an internet that, that they're responding to. And that's the same for any group of artists, which is that as they get older, their work becomes more of their time. So that would be really interesting just to see whether that actually has a significant effect. Mm. Well, what I was going to move us on to is talking about specific artists that are related to the movement and to the, some of the visual images that we have here. So maybe if we start with Shannon, because um, you've already mentioned Emile Zill, yes. who's currently got some slides up, um, and talk about some of the examples of artists that you've worked with at Bus sure, Projects. Sure. Yeah, I think um, for me that was kind of what I could bring to this, I guess, as someone who's very focused locally, I guess, um, in terms of, um, but, a, but a sort of notice this, especially in Melbourne, this kind of, um, as I was saying, these kind of tropes coming through. Um, some of the people that I've sort of provided some images for, um, Emile Zeal, Tara Cook. Um, this is Tara Cook here. Yeah. Yes, yes. Holly Childs was just up before Tara, yes. and Emile was just on loop before that. Indeed. So, but they all, and they all kind of play in different ways. So, um, uh, Emile, when I first came in contact with uh, um, Emile's work, it was through a video where he was, um, again, this is, it was a high definition, it was like 4K kind of thing of his studio, just his studio, a very wide angle lens of him sort of performing um, what he kind of titled of as, as production kind of logos to the camera with his hands. And, um, uh, so there was this kind of, um, that kind of intrigued me in terms of this, uh, this very much a kind of a, a 
I don't know, almost a Bruce Nauman-ish kind of studio shot, um, but then this kind of blending in of, of, um, of, of appropriation and film kind of culture, and then that led me to his YouTube account where he has these kind of rather puzzling unboxing videos which passed us by a little while ago, um, which seem to use the brash language, again, going back to this language, it seems to use the visual and, actu and, and vocal tropes of, um, of unboxing, of vlogging, um, and he tends to exploit that in ways that are both very natural to that. You know, one, one has a sense that he is a fan that he does watch a lot, that he um, is both kind of a, an observer, a creator, and kind of a, a, um, a kind of a, a believer in it almost. Um, and if anyone saw his talk, again, I was unfortunately not uh, stuck at my booth, but whenever we had the chance to kind of present a talk, he takes it as a stage. He takes it almost as a as a as a, a brash internet blogger, um, which is uh, which is full of hype and bluster, um, and he tends to he does a work. Um, which he's done a number of times in a different space, where he'll um, he'll YouTube to a to a, he'll carry a rock in and then YouTube to it, and this very kind of open kind of style of personal address that we're familiar with from that straight on um, uh, internet um, framing, um, which which again we're so familiar with, so therefore this kind of twist on it kind of creates in this real in the real world kind of creates this interesting friction. Um, the key word, he, he has on his site key search terms under his bio, which is sort of a, a rather playful um, address to this as well. But in, in a sense, his key things are that the, he's interested in the effects of mediation um, on experience through communication technology. The other artist, I think, that observes this commonality, or again, locally, is Tara Cook. Tara also ran a gallery here uh, in Melbourne as well that kind of showed a lot of of this kind of work, and um, she was interested in, or she is interested in, the artist's relationship with technology through research and curatorship, and she was texting me her um, artist statement, she's got a show coming up with us, and I thought perhaps it characterised a lot of this interesting um, use of language, codified language that we talked about earlier on, she's, and forgive me, I haven't read this before, it just came through, so it might go on, but she says, ancient archaeological artifacts are destroyed and resurrected as artifact-laden gifts, while um, migratory images of dead children washed up on the shore of social media feed. What can one uh, do when faced with a daily experience of global loss and screens in local environment? Um, uh, my exhibition, Spatial Effects, um, asks this question to confront the horror of contemporary digital imagery. So again, communication. Um, um, kind of this mush of content coming in and how does she kind of experience that and then generate work from that and, and kind of live it. Um, perhaps linking those together at the end, really at continuing this notion of language, um, is the writer and artist and editor, Holly Charles. Um, I thought best to mention her because it seemed to relate to some of our common, common themes, but she's interested in digital semiotics, um, transformations of language, obscurities, fashion, um, and corruption, I guess, and that relates to corruption of imagery, relates to corruption of language, of meaning, um, and they, they all work in, in Victoria, I guess, and they've all engaged with us in different ways. Um, uh, but they just kind of cast out some of the commonalities I'm seeing. And Quinton, you've collected some post-internet art, um, and some examples of, of artists who you've collected are up on the screen now. Did you want to mention some of those? Yeah, I, I first started collecting um, works by Michael Staniak. I think Michael's in the audience. Um, Michael, are you here? No. no. Okay, he was, uh, they said they may be coming. Um, so I initially um, came across Michael by um, looking at the auctions, and I'm talking about auctions not here within Australia, but I'm look, um, talking about auctions um, in, the, in America and in uh, the UK. So Michael Staniak's um, age 33, he's been in the auction scene for the last two, three years overseas, very much in demand overseas, and his market is predominantly overseas. I think Australia has been very slow in embracing his works, uh, but Michael is now in every major auction, Sotheby's, um, Christie's, Phillips auction. Uh, he has work coming up in each of these auctions, and so 
when I looked at the auctions and this, the name Michael Staniak kept, kept coming up, I knew that he was an important player or important artist um, because his name was constantly coming up. So, you know, Michael is a young artist. Uh, he certainly makes interesting works. I have uh, looked at his works a number of times online and um, was uh, privileged to acquire a couple, uh, I think it was earlier this year or the end of last year. And my research into his practice, into what he does, and um, I think led me to research more about post-internet art, and I think that's how it kind of started and you could say snowballed. Um, you know, Michael put me on to other artists that he thought were interesting. Um, and um, so the other people that uh, I've started collecting are uh, Rye David Bradley, uh, again, Melbourne artist, as Michael Staniak is. Um, a couple of others, uh, Sydney-based artists, um, uh, Johnny Nish. Johnny Nish, uh, I think you've had the uh, target uh, yeah. paintings okay. up. Uh, he's been in quite a number of exhibitions of late. Um, then a couple of artists that are living overseas right now, Andy Boot. Andy Boot uh, resides somewhere in Europe and has shown in New York, has shown uh, quite widely in Europe. Um, there's also... Um, Andre Hammer. Andre Hammer is uh, Kiwi, but uh, now resides in Paris and is certainly uh, having quite a, a, a prominent profile in this um, international art uh, world. He's on the cover of this book called uh, Painters of Tomorrow, which you may have seen around. This um, is Andre Hammer up now. Yeah, and I think his works are quite beautiful and seductive. And I. Um, what I do find is that uh, these artists, the ones that are successful, do have a uh, profile that rises very rapidly. Say, someone like Michael Staniak has had um, a, a solo show in the uh, Institute of Contemporary Arts, St. Louis, um, which uh, a lot of our you know, Australian artists would not have had a show after, you know, he, I think he's only been practicing perhaps maybe five or, or, or thereabout years. Um, and he's been included in a number of uh, international shows as well. So, you know, when, when they are successful, they seem to uh, get successful very quickly, which is something that seems to be happening with um, young contemporary artists these days. Um, Tom? Um, no, I was thinking yeah. as well that if you didn't want to talk about specific artists, that some of your projects might relate in, in a post-internet application. They might. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's a very funny thing because part of this label is that actually if you did want to signify, you could also suggest that these are artists, so, so it goes without saying that all of these artists are multimedia, multidisciplinary. They don't work within specific, um, they, they're, they're not generally painters, or, but they may be painters. They are not generally filmmakers, but they probably make films. And actually, uh, uh, sort of, I work with a lot of young talent coming through design schools, and, and if, they, if, if you are determined to be very, very distinct about your, your skill set, then that, that is um, quite unusual now, because they have grown up with all of these tools, so they have explored all of these tools. And the thing that I think signifies post-internet artists more than anything else is a willingness to work within the gallery infrastructure, the art world infrastructure, mm. to work with... Um, the, the, the white cube to create work that can be experienced in these sorts of spaces, to work with commodifiable, uh, to make objects that can be sold by your gallery, um, to make um, sort of work that, that has some kind of um, rationale for um, institutions to put shows together, um, despite the fact that none, none of those are actually prerogative for art. Um, and it's very difficult because you, I can, you know, the people like, if we did want to talk about Australians, I'm terribly fond of, of um, a young man called Pez in um, Perth who makes the most extraordinary um, films and came to light making um, mash-up, well, making films, music, music videos out of cut-up Disney films, which got him into so much trouble that he had to go and work for Disney for a year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which I think is amazing, but he doesn't exist within, he actually exists within the music industry rather more, but it, it is very, uh, sort of, it fits within all of our, our categorizations, but it's not commodifiable, whereas um, Christian Markley 
does the same thing, takes internet footage, which he has dubious legal right to use, and then repurposes it into 24-hour films, which work incredibly beautifully. And I don't know if anyone spent time at the MCA, but it's one of the, you know, it's, the, the clock is an astonishing work and completely impossible without the internet, without this, this access that we have to. But I don't think he considers himself within this group. Mm -hmm. So this group at the moment is very much of more of a kind of label or a brand or a kind of, well, it is branding really. It's a sort of way of uh, self-identifying. So there's a strong sense of self-identifying and actually if you do look at the, 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 the discussions, the discourse going on around it, you very often come across artists saying, I'm not part of that post-internet thing, which is a rejection not of the ideas, but just of the, the clique. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's a, it, it is rather difficult to kind of to do this, but I, I do think it will, in time, we will look back and, and ignore slightly more the, the social structures and, and look rather more at the work that has been sustained, and it will, it will feel much more natural. Yeah, um, sorry. No. You know, I guess sometimes it's also a matter of, um, there are artists that use it as, uh, yes, I will relate to this group um, when it suits me, when, the, you know, there is a show, um, say, at uh, an important museum, uh, and then they're being selected for that show, then obviously it's, it's good to, to then say, yeah, they, they are making post-internet work, whereas I guess there are other artists who think, uh, look, I don't want to be uh, tied down to a particular movement alone. You don't know how long this movement is going to last. This is something that we've, we've, we've mm. discussed. Um, so perhaps, you know, the, the people who, the artists that might want to play it safe might just say, no, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm um, multimedia. I do various different things and post-internet art is, is a portion, a part of my, uh, what I do, but it's not the be all and end all of what I do. It is, mm. it is, um, uh, I, a couple of years ago, I put together an uh, exhibition proposal, actually, um, which was around, um, I think it's actually called Neo Geo Art, which is a label that I actually rather like. Um, but, but for me, it was very much about understanding that there were practicing artists working within the framework of the art um, world um, who were making work which was very, very post-internet. And... and um, and, and for the, our proposal, we, we specifically looked for artists using Google, Google Maps, Google Geo tools. Um, and it, it, it was actually, it's a really strong roster of artists, and it's absolutely fascinating. But it, again, at that kind of classification label, some of them considered themselves internet artists. They were still net artists because the work that they were making existed. Um, uh, um, I forget the name of the artist, but James Bridle has the equivalent version of it, which is um, where the, he's created a kaleidoscope out of, out of satellite imagery so that you can, you, can, um, you can pick a location using Google Earth, and then it, it maps it into four things, and then you move in, and it creates an extraordinary kaleidoscopic is pattern. John Rathman? So, um, yeah, and I think John Rathman has yeah. made the, the similar works yes. as prints, yes. i.e. a highly saleable version of yes. the same experience. Yes. And I thought this, I really wanted to put both these works yeah. alongside each other and say this, is, this work is very valuable and is a, is a serious piece of art. And this is an experiment by, um, a, well, admittedly, a, a, an established critic. And actually, if you did want another label, James Bridle, I don't know if anyone knows James Bridle's work. He's a, a, um, he's a very bright boy. Um, who, based in London, who has written since 2011 um, a blog called The New Aesthetic, which, which does touch on and I think encapsulates an awful lot of these ideas, but it's even harder to kind of pin down into a thing. The other, one of the other artists that I really love is um, um, Mishka Henna, is it? Mish yes, Mishka Henna, who um, is, um, um, is, it, is it him or Rathman who did Nine Eyes? Um, but these sorts of artists who spend an awful lot of time going through Street View, finding um, automatic photos. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's sort of re reminiscent of, Steve, of um, Richard Prince, in that these are found images, found on the internet, which, re which recontextualize, i.e. Taking, taking something which is totally meaningless, and taken by, not even taken by a human, a photo taken by a computer that happened to be driving past, and then brought into and art context become incredibly profound and beautiful images. Um, and that to me is, is, is 
absolutely fascinating. Um, and, and, and especially as we move into an era of increasingly automated and artificially intelligent creativity, um, which I think will be the next interesting, maybe we'll be here in a few years' time talking about um, mm -hmm. AI art, um, mm. <laughs> is, is a real kind of um, the, the sort of work that this should be, where it, it forces you to stop and examine what, um, what we mean by like that, the, the artist's process or the artist's method. So there, there, are, there are many, many artists that I think are doing work in this space that's fascinating. Um, I just don't think all of them fit into the little mm. uh, group. box. Mm. Mm. One final thing I was going to say is that it seems quite appropriate that this be quickly um, a, a quick, again another quick moment that is then archived for analysis. Mm. Given it's almost um, it's almost appropriate that it follows a, a certain sort of technological obsolescence model. So as one um, uh, kind of thing reaches its kind of capacity, we need to kind of move on quickly to a, either different technologies, different kind of operating systems, and different operating modes, perhaps within practice as well. And if these things seem to be um, increasingly kind of close to um, technological uh, means of communication and, um, and technological means of production that they will follow that same rapid or increasingly rapid um, uh, process of, re um, of renewal within technology as well. Um, although we talked about a bit of nostalgia, I think that's kind of an interesting thing. There's an incredibly organic quality to a lot of digital work, which we don't think it could be organic because it's computers, so that's not... But the decay, and uh, you know the decay cycle because you all have to renew your iPhone every year. Um, and that's happening with the art world as well. I mean, it, it, we talk about restoration or main, I mean, it must be one of the, one of the, uh, one of the, the, the aspects of bringing the work from um, this digital space where it cannot be guaranteed that it will be supported and an awful lot of net art is now lost, probably forever because of things like um, security vulnerabilities or um, so, so, so all of the inter all of the software in the world is updated and overnight an entire world of, of processing art which I'm sure which is a, a, t a software tool was lost mm -hmm. and those artists are not going to revisit this and recreate their work they're not going to do that um, mm -hmm. but when it is in this form we, we don't face that challenge I think we should open it up to questions from the audience, if anyone has any. I have more questions myself, if no one's ready. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, I did have, I heard Douglas Copeland speak, and he was at the Google Institute in Paris, and you mm. probably know about this where he, got access to their archives, I guess, and he did um, put together this book of all the search terms that people searched all around the world. And it was this beautiful book, but mm. it just made me think, listening to this, that how this kind of art, it, can't, it needs to have some sort of physical presence, or, or can, it, can it just exist in the internet? I love that's my it, question. Yeah. So I worked on that book, so did I, you? Feel, feel, I could <laughs> probably pick that one up. Um, and it was very interesting because Douglas asked us for all the search terms. Um, and then it's sort of like, I think about a million search terms and, and, um, and then we had to kind of um, mill them down so that they weren't uh, incredibly obscene. Um, and and it, it creates this extraordinary, because it's obviously in, there's no kind of narrative, there's nothing linear about it. It's something quite close to the phone book, but without even the function of the phone book. And, and it's and a really kind of, hypnotic way into language and how we use language and how we understand information and it's astonishing he's an astonishing man um, and we're very lucky to have him working with us on these things and it's a book um, and I do think it's um, I, I, uh, I'm a huge fan of physical things actually and I'm very interested in how we integrate digital into physical however I'm also a huge fan of performance and I don't think that I don't think that any form of performance is the less for the fact that it cannot be maintained. So when we talk about um, the need for the physical, um, I, I actually just feel that, and I think books are moving into this space as well, the project that we're working on at the moment, these, these books become more like performance than this old paradigm of something that goes in a library. Um, and art becomes more like, um, more ephemeral and less like this thing that we want to hold on to. 
and actually for the generation coming up where there is a super abundance both of physical and digital this need to hold on to preserve and I'm not sure why we feel but it is a very strong cultural thing um, they, they seem much more comfortable with the idea that they will go it will go <laughs> it will pass they have an entire messaging platform devoted to the idea that they don't need to keep it which my generation can't really cope with the idea that but the Snapchat so it just goes it just and and it's the same with um, well I, especially with books which I we're just launching a project where you begin to understand that the books are much more performative because they are read there is content that is read or performed by a machine just like a play would be performed by a, um, a, a troupe of actors um, and then when people no longer want to pay for this performance by the machine the performance will end and that book will move on and the content will still exist because it's a series of words but because the works are dynamic and, and work with the machines and um, maybe about you or maybe about the location or maybe about all of these things they're never going to be experienced in exactly the same way so they're just new paradigms of, f of form which doesn't mean that beautiful things that go in your house are going away it just means that that's actually not how the next generation of artists want to reflect our world to us how we archive that is a, is a slightly different question I think also that my understanding is that um, there is that slight distinction between digital art and that post-internet art. Digital art, as uh, Tom has uh, alluded to, a lot of it is like, a, um, you know, video. It's, it's things that are mainly digital in form, whereas post-internet art tends to have a physical element to it. So, yes, there is video. Um, some artists like... Uh, um, Corey Archangel, as you mentioned, uh, um, does make uh, video art, and he's um, you know one of the uh, most prominent American post-internet artists. But um, often um, there is there are quite a lot of artists who do make physical objects, so sculpture, uh, paintings, print, uh, print of the um, the John Rathman um, mm -hmm. Google images of um, you know strange, unusual things that are found as a result of. Google Street um, taking photographs, so uh, that uh, it works in a way that uh, it's easier for the collector of or museums to put on a show where there are actual objects to to put on display because um, there is the element of uh, physicality to it as well. Mm. I was going to say as well in terms of that relationship between um, this kind of post-internet uh, engagement and its physical manifestations. I think certainly uh, again, referring back to my experience of local practitioners, certainly. Uh, there's an interesting wave of engagement between this post-internet activity and poetry and performed poetry as well, um, which is quite exciting at the moment to see again coming out of this perhaps this cross-pollination between fashion and 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 visual art. But it's it seems to come from this again language, this coded language, but performed live to an audience. This kind of distilling of this um, uh, you know, actually quite um, seemingly huge but very niche uh, way of conversing. Twitter languages, Twitter kind of collections of material that is uh, generally uh, ideally kind of sent for a moment, for a moment of impact, but that, that is then distilled and um, organized in a way that can be then performed live, which has this interesting impact between this language that is usually considered perhaps as a, uh, as a frivolous uh, momentary communication or provocation, then recontextualized in this rather somber uh, performance aspect is an interesting thing that I've, I've seen uh, uh, or experienced myself which is quite exciting um, so there's just another way that these kind of digital languages or digital texts are still being used by artists even though they're very online engaged in a, in a very live and immediate and emotional setting any other questions thank you that was really interesting um, Clinton you're talking about works that you've bought via auction um, post-internet works at Christie's or Sotheby's or Phillips. And I was wondering, and the arts have been around for perhaps five years, and I was wondering whether the galleries are selling them via the um, auction house or the artists are selling them directly via auction or how the, why the auction houses take them when the artists have only been around for five years. Mm. Uh, sorry if I miss... miss. <laughs> Um, misled you say um, I've discovered the artists on uh, at the auctions but I haven't purchased them from the auctions so you know they, they, uh, when I look at the auction catalogs and I see this uh, the names and the artists that are in the auctions 
Um, I then have gone online to Google about the artists and gone to the galleries to purchase the works. So, but I think um, um, artists like Michael Staniak, which I mentioned, uh, are very are quite high in demand right now. And uh, the uh, his gallery here in in Melbourne uh, um, has told me that they've got a very big uh, wait list for 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 works. So I guess if, if you can't get a work through the gallery, then maybe it is the auction that you have to look at. Um, and Philip's Auction House actually is kind of known as one of the auction houses that um, specialises in what they call wet paint art, which means that it goes straight out of the artist's studio and to the auction house. And in that way, the auction house kind of becomes the primary dealer as well as the secondary market. They're the primary market cuts out the gallery as well. Sometimes that happens and sometimes the process of going through the studio to the gallery to the auction house is actually quite quick, especially if the demand is high and the person who bought the work now wants to buy an, maybe another work from another artist or from the same artist but is ready to pass on the work to the auction house to another collector. Yeah, I agree. Mm. Yeah, the, uh, Philip's auction has been a great tool for me to learn about post-internet art to see the names, the work that come um, on, on the auctions every uh, you know, several months, um, tells me what's hot right now in, the, in, in terms of the post-internet art market. Is that Phillips in London? Or? Phillips, London, Phillips, New York, yeah. Phillips in general. But having said that, you know, if I could just say one thing, it, it, it is backed up by the whole movement, I think, has got some basis. Because people say, look, how long is this going to last? Are, they, are these artists going to be around in the next uh, 50, 100 years? I guess I don't know. But um, the fact that uh, museums are having shows of post-internet art, I've just returned from uh, um, Lyon Biennial, and 10% of the works that were in Lyon were actually post-internet artists or post-internet art. So, you know, I think there is certainly a, 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 a um, support for, for shows um, at very major centers, as you mentioned, Melissa, at um, which center had a show recently? Um, New Museum in New York. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's been Allen Center uh, in Beijing. Um, a number of other very important uh, museums and surveys have uh, included post-internet art, and I think that will only increase with time. Mm. Howdy. Um, Whoa. <laughs> hello. Um, one of the things that I think, that I, I think is interesting about our post-digital art is the idea of physicality. Um, you know, it gets talked about that there's a physical um, aspect to a traditional practice like painting, but especially in regards to that kind of post-internet, um, almost young, lean aesthetic um, of, you know, pixelation and old school fonts and stuff like that, is that there is this intense physical practice to digital art. And when it comes to observing digital art, especially in regards to videos, the kind of need to, to press play and when the audience can, you know, physically see it stop, I think that it could be argued that uh, that kind of digital art has a more physical practice than you could have when it comes to viewing a uh, painting or a sculpture because the audience is in complete control, uh, almost as much control as the artist has in regards to viewing the work. Um, what do you think of that? Um, that might be a question for Tom. Well, I think, I, again, like, I, I sort of just broadly on the concept of, of, of physical and using traditional practices. Um, you are, it, it might be worth examining the motivation for physical practices. Uh, you know, whether, why, why these works are more um, vibrant or real or, or, or kind of... Or, or why? why? Um, with regard to video, and actually with regard to most of these of our forms, um, one of the things that is, um, is very prevalent or, or, or will be more prevalent is linearity. So when you talk about pressing play and the control, you have very sim limited control because you press play and you press pause. And actually, um, that, that's, there's, a, there's a level of linearity that, that exists in, in film, video and in performance and in um, literature, less so in, in the visual arts because it's the thing, um, where it's not really relevant within the digital frame because 
that line can go anywhere. You can take it into many different forms. It can be both interactive, where you begin to, where the viewer or the audience begins to um, affect. You have agency over the art form that you're experiencing. Um, or it can literally be a non-linear form, where there are many different avenues with which you can follow through the words or the performance of the video. Um, so these are things that we're just not even getting around yet. Um, and, and artists are very unwilling to move from forms that they know and understand and have grown up with. Um, to, so we are beginning to kind of, I think, actually in 50 years, we'll be looking back and going, yeah, it's kind of there, but they're not actually doing anything that they couldn't have done 20, 30, 40 years ago. So for me, um, uh, there, is, there, is a, there is a lot further to go with, with regard to that sense that you, you talk about about the physicality of being able to interact with your work. We have, we have a video project which is on a cube where you can, you, you, the video exists on six sides, so the viewer has complete agency over it and, they, and we found it was much more effective when we turned that into a physical um, cube in order to do exactly what you're saying, which is to have control over the um, um, thing you're experiencing. And the greatest challenge out of that almost entire project was finding video makers who are not intimidated by that. Um, I think it's, it is an interesting, it, it, well, I think we're the beginning, really. I don't, know if it's on, I don't know if it's on point in terms of this, but in terms of that, uh, the, I mean, I watch a lot of video. I watch a lot of online video. It's practically going all the time. My poor phone is abused. It's, it's the now the primary video watching uh, method. Um, and I've noticed, it, and I, I, I guess I, I watch a lot of artist videos. I watch a lot of people who kind of play in this kind of space. Um, uh, it tends to be block blended with this kind of blogging culture. Um, it tends not to be kind of filmic works or, or kind of you know, watching kind of long form movies and this device, but I tend to watch a lot now in bed and, uh, and it kind of is something that um, uh, I kind of either watch or then, or, then watch, or then just listen to a movie by putting it in a pocket now that it can rove and now that I have enough gigabytes on my phone to kind of burn that throughout the, the period. So, so if something's happening there that I know that, that we're getting into something else when we're talking about the devices, but certainly that the physical presence of sleeping with this technology, I know they say that's bad for one, but, but that there's something happening there in terms of the way I consume artists' material, artists' blogs, artists' material, artists' films, artists' videos, um, films like, you know, that are done by people like Emil if I'm supposed to be doing serious research. I now no longer have to kind of slouch um, over a cold computer. Uh, I can sit in bed and, and do all this kind of research and consume their work in that way. Maybe they didn't want it consumed in that way, but I'm, I'm doing it. So there's something there in terms of the physicality, even apart from the stop and play that I'm kind of interested in exploring uh, that's much more personal, much more intimate, and perhaps, you know, rather like some sort of, you know, thing that you listen to if you're trying to learn something um, and sleep, you know, it becomes something that's, that's really quite intimate um, to the body. Um. Keep it there, it's 6.30, um, unless there's any final questions. But I think we're good. Thanks for joining us. You can just look all this stuff up online anyway. Yeah, yeah. and thanks <laughs> to the panelists.